Hi everyone, uh, welcome back again. This is the second uh, of a series of uh, surgical research lectures and I'm going to be talking today about a very uh, specific uh, topic uh, within the research proposal uh, uh, lectures. Uh, this, this topic, uh, while it's actually a very small uh, part of your proposal, it actually sets the tone for how the actual research is going to be conducted. And this will be on framing your research question, hypothesis and objectives. So before we go on to research questions, uh, hypothesis, etc., we have to start with what the problem statement is. A problem statement actually describes and explains the problem that you wish to investigate in the broadest term possible. It usually provides a roadmap and an overview of what uh, you want to achieve uh, in this research project. As you can see here, the, 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 you can identify the problems relatively easily with a question mark, but then there are so many ways to climb that mountain. There are so many parts. And uh, the, uh, what you have to do in this problem statement is establish that there is a problem in the broadest term and there are multiple pathways to achieve this problem. What you are going to do in the next few uh, uh, steps is identify the best way to, uh, to solve uh, the problem that you have set in front of you. The characteristics of a problem statement is that it addresses a gap in the knowledge. That means you must be clear about what you have done in the past and why further research is needed. It needs to identify and delineate the research problem. Uh, and the problem itself should be able to be investigated. It cannot be a problem that you cannot investigate within the time frame and the uh, facilities you have. It must, the problem statement must explain what the researcher wants to solve and what questions he or she wishes to be answered. The argument that the available knowledge is insufficient to solve it must be convincing. And you have to explain why the study is important. Uh, the, 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 you must remember the problem statement forms a foundation for further uh, progress of your research proposal itself. We've covered the problem statement as briefly as possible, but how do we move on to the background and significance of the study itself? How, uh, this, this is usually what you would, uh, in, in, prop, in uh, uh, normal terms, count as the uh, introduction part of your proposal. So in the introduction part, we'd have to explain what is the problem or the question you want to answer, what is already known about the problem, what do you think is unknown and can be improved? And how do you want to achieve this? Uh, by doing all of this, you will be able to answer the introduction part of it. In fact, honestly speaking, the introduction part is very simple. Answer these four questions and you've already got four paragraphs of introduction ready. Once we have done the problem statement and background uh, of this uh, proposal itself, we move to the crux of the topic today which is the research question, aim, hypothesis, objective. These are all interchangeable. Uh, uh, in fact, most of you all use it interchangeably, the research question, hypothesis, objective, but they all have a specific uh, definition, a specific meaning, a specific role in the proposal itself. And we're going to go through each one of these in specific detail so that we are clear about the role of each uh, element. This slide shows a broad overview of how we develop the research objectives. We start with the area of research, which is usually acquired from our day-to-day -day activities where you have got certain research questions you would like to investigate, or from scientific literature, scientific activities like conferences, etc., or from your discussion with your supervisors. That's where you get an idea of what kind of a, a research you would like to do. This is then refined into a specific research problem you'd like to investigate. And again, uh, we have to go through the same iteration of literature review uh, and a discussion before you uh, specify that problem into a research question. At this point in time, certain tools like Finer and Picot would actually help you define it in a uh, much more specific way. The research question itself is what you would like to study. This is the converted into a research hypothesis, which is a formal, testable statement of intent. And finally, only after you have got through 
the research problem question hypothesis do we come into the specific research objectives which will lead you to uh, the uh, actual methodology of doing the research itself so we talked so much about research question what exactly is a research question a research question is a structured question that is asked by the researcher about a subject of interest and which is usually based on a problem that the scientific community has either not solved or is uh, still arguing about. There is usually uncertainty about that specific problem that needs meaningful understanding and deliberate investigation. These questions are usually acquired from, as I mentioned earlier, day-to-day -day clinical activities, scientific literature activities, as well as scientific mentors and collaborators. The criteria for developing a good research question uh, is uh, simplified in the acronym FINA. FINA stands for F for feasible, I for interesting, N for novel, E for ethical, and R for relevant. Feasible in the sense that that study must be doable within the period of uh, allocated to you. It must be cost efficient and funds friendly. It must be sample size friendly. This is an important uh, point. It must uh, be done within the technical expertise available to you in that time period. It must be interesting because if it's not interesting, nobody's going to read. And, uh, nobody's going to be interested in listening to you or reading the research itself. It must be novel in that it must not be answered yet. It must confirm or refute previous findings. It can be done within a new setting or new population, but there must be an underlying scientific basis to why it needs to be done in this population. Because this is a typical thing uh, a lot of students use. Oh, it has not been done in Malaysia. It's not been done in Southeast Asia. Or worse still, it's not been done in this uh, particular region. I, I, I don't think that itself is a reason to do a study. It must have a scientific basis in that in this region, we have got a higher population of Aboriginals who have got a different genetic uh, pool and thereby we think the certain uh, findings may be different. So it must be convincing, as I mentioned earlier. Any study must be ethical. There must be a social and scientific value. It must be safe. And it must be relevant in that it must advance scientific knowledge. It must influence your clinical practice and it must it possibly should impact health policy as well as guide future research. We'll go step by step into each of this uh, component because these are these are important concepts to understand. When we talk about feasibility, let's take an example: a randomized controlled trial of conservative versus surgical management for acute appendicitis. Is this feasible? It is. It does sound feasible. It is doable within the period of study. Uh, I think it is cost efficient and sample size friendly. We do do a lot of acute appendicitis and the technical expertise is available. What about a, a, a follow-up study, a randomized controlled trial of conservative versus surgical management for Mackel's diverticulum? As opposed to acute appendicitis, it's very clear that the sample, this is not sample size friendly. Mackel's diverticulum is very rare. You would not be able to do it within a time period, especially not a randomized controlled trial. Uh, and and, and uh, this is how you assess for feasibility of studies. Uh, uh, another example of a non-feasible study, a prospective feasibility study of robotic appendicectomy in UMMC. In the first place, we do not have a robot in UMMC. And in the second place, uh, actually uh, doing a study like this will not be sample size friendly. So these are the kind of studies you want to avoid at all costs because they are not feasible. What about interesting? You've got efficacy of local analgesia in laparotomy wound pain. Uh, while it may be uh, uh, may, may have not been done before, it's not really uh, picking my interest. I, I, I'm not going to sit down and say, oh my God, I, I, I would like to know what efficacy of local analgesia is like. Uh, similarly, a retrospective review of outcome of appendicectomy in UMMC. I'm not really interested in this, uh, as I'm not interested in an audit of varicose veins. It has to be something that actually makes me interested, makes me sit up and uh, look at it and say, mm, I would like to find out what, what is going on here. I'd like to see if it makes a difference for my practice. The study must be novel. It must have been something that has not been answered yet. It must either confirm or refute previous findings and it must be in a, in a, a setting or population that has not been done yet. 
Let's take an example, the effect of preoperative pregabalin in postoperative pain control in spine surgery. So we would like to find out whether giving preoperative medication will actually make an improvement in postoperative pain control. Similarly, uh, the role of interleukins and TNF in predicting gastric tumor recurrence. These are may be novel, may not have been answered yet, uh, or they may be uh, refuting previous findings. So they are interesting enough for us to pay attention to. What about ethical? This is a very, very important uh, point. All research must be ethical. It must have social and scientific value. And most importantly, it must be safe for both the patient and the healthcare worker. Uh, let's talk about uh, examples, role of prophylactic antibiotics in VP shunt surgery or appendicectomy or laparotomy. The role of prophylactic antibiotics has been established, very well established. There is no way for us to actually uh, not give anti prophylactic antibiotics for any elective surgery, in, uh, especially in a cavity which is very sensitive like the cranium or abdomen or thoracic. So this doing a prophylactic antibiotic study uh, in, in, a, in this kind of cases is not ethical. What about uh, trial of antibiotics versus no antibiotics or trial of new antibiotics versus current antibiotics? Maybe these kind of trials, especially new antibiotics versus current antibiotics, might be more feasible than uh, no antibiotics versus antibiotics. So these are the kind of things you need to sit down and analyze before you decide what is the best way to go forward. Another question, cell savers are routinely used in cardiac surgery. Can I investigate the efficacy of cell savers in cardiac surgery? Might be a bit difficult because we have already established the fact that they are routinely used and they have been proven to be effective. In that case, how are you going to reanalyze the efficacy of cell savers when stopping or randomizing them into maybe I won't use in some patients might actually endanger the outcome of these patients. So again, ethics here plays an important role in deciding whether you can move forward with this study. You must remember any of this study should not disadvantage the patient's care and outcome in any way at all. What about relevance? The relevance of every study should be that it should advance scientific knowledge, even by a little bit. It must influence your clinical practice. It may or may not impact your health policy and guide future research, but it should be something that is relevant for future use. Let's look at identification of biliary microorganism during cholecystectomy. So this was an actual study done by one of your seniors, uh, proposed actually by one of your seniors, in that uh, that uh, candidate wanted to uh, identify biliary microorganisms during cholecystectomy. But how is this relevant? You've already done the cholecystectomy. If you find a microorganism, it is retrospective. You're going to give the antibiotics anyway, and it would not make any difference in the outcome of the patient. Uh, it does not actually change your practice if you're going to identify biliary microorganisms during cholecystectomy as opposed to if you wanted to identify the microorganisms uh, during an ERCP. In that case, you can actually treat the patient prior to uh, surgery. What about comparisons between two methods to assess urodynamic flow? Uh, may, it may be relevant in that uh, you may be able to find a more cost-effective uh, method to uh, assess the urodynamic flow. A qualitative study on reasons for refusal of mastectomy among Malaysian women in, with breast cancer. This sounds very relevant to me because it is uh, able to advance scientific knowledge. It will definitely influence our clinical practice and it will in fact have an impact on health policy, especially among Malaysian women. So there are some studies that are going to be more relevant than others, but at the very least, we must try to make it uh, useful. A good research question allows us to uh, identify the target population it guides the appropriate choice of study subjects. Uh, you will be able to identify the outcome variables very clearly and determine what type of study is needed. It will suggest the best way to collect the data and influence the number of study participants. And that's why it is very, very essential that we start the study, the proposal with a good research question. When you actually present to us with a research question, you must write the problem as a simple question. What is the problem you want to investigate? And that should be the simplest and easiest way for you to write the research question.
Let's take a few more examples. Uh, uh, what is the importance of genetic research in medical field? This is too broad a question. Uh, a more specific question would be how might the discovery of genetic basis of alcoholism impact the triage processes in medical facilities. So you become much more specific because you want it to be measurable and testable and uh, uh, you want to be able to investigate the uh, results, not just something very broad. Uh, moving on to another question, how are children affected by exposure to social media? This is too vague, too broad, too uh, non-specific. You need to have much more specific what is the effect of Instagram likes on the self-esteem of children under the age of 12. Remember what I said, it must identify your population, it must guide the methodology of the study. So the, early, the, the, the earlier uh, research questions are not appropriate because they are either too broad or too weak. So moving on to the, uh, we have covered research question. Let's move on to the next uh, uh, concept, which is research hypothesis. They are not interchangeable. The question is a separate from research hypothesis. The research hypothesis itself is a specific statement of expectation or prediction that is usually tested by re during research. When we talk about hypothesis testing, we are talking about the method of determining whether the outcome of clinical trials is positive or negative. We also have the concept of null hypothesis, which is no difference between groups or no relationship between variables. The null hypothesis is a presumption of status quo or no change. It can be tested by concluding if there is or there is no relationship between two variables or two phenomena. And that's how you decide whether the null hypothesis is uh, valid uh, or uh, is uh, not valid. So let's take an example of uh, hypothesis. Elevated CRP predicts ruptured appendicitis. And my null hypothesis will be elevated CRP does not predict ruptured appendicitis. This is too simplistic in that uh, all you're doing is you're just putting a knot in there. Okay. A better way to write a null hypothesis in this case would be there is no correlation between elevated CRP levels and ruptured appendicitis. Remember, it's easier to write a null hypothesis as no effect, no correlation, no impact, no uh, direct uh, 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 causation between the uh, dependent and independent variable. And that's how you write a null hypothesis. The typical phrases you would use in a, a null hypothesis will be no effect, no difference, no relationship, no change, does not increase, does not decrease, etc. So we have covered now the research question and research hypothesis. And we finally come to the research objective. So how is research objective different from questions and hypotheses? The research objective itself is a specific statement of intent in research progress. It is an active statement about how the study is going to answer the specific research question. Remember in the earlier uh, slides, I showed you the mountain with multiple pathways trails. The research objectives are the specific subsets of the trail. So you've chosen one trail, which is your research problem. And that one trail is now broken into multiple so short segments, which will specifically investigate certain components of that research problem. And the objectives will state exactly which outcome measures will be are going to be measured. And uh, the, these outcomes, you must remember, must be patient-centric and clinically relevant. A good research objective defines the scope of the study, and it should be stated as outcomes or solution rather than process-based. A process-based uh, uh, statement is usually better suited to be in the methodology section. The research objective should also specify the results of an activity. It must collectively test all parts of your hypothesis, not just some parts. And each objective should not be dependent on the outcome of an earlier objective. Uh, I, I will explain this in detail later when we move to the next slide. So the research objective is usually stated as either primary and secondary objectives. The primary objective is a single objective, which is a, a, the main uh, question you would like to investigate and this is usually stated as to do something to evaluate to quantify to assess to establish to compare to identify etc 
and it must align or reflect both your research question and the research hypothesis. You can have further secondary objectives, but please try to stick to about two to three objectives and not more than that. Because you must remember every objective must have a uh, analysis um, done and must have a uh, outcome presented. So every objective must have an outcome presented. There must be a logical sequence to these secondary objectives. Don't just leave them hanging uh, independently. The objectives usually are assessed through the SMART criteria, which is specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-based. And these are various action verbs you can use based on the SMART goal. Uh, the slides will be shared with you, so you can have a look at it later. We come back to the overview slide, which I showed earlier, where we have started from a broad area of research through a research problem into the research question, the hypothesis, and finally, development of the objectives. By doing it step by step, we are able to uh, uniformly develop our objectives, which will be able to be tested later during the methodology and uh, final results. I'm going to share a few uh, recently presented uh, uh, proposals from some of our first years. Uh, again, this is no criticism and uh, this does not mean these are good or bad. We are just using them as uh, samples of what uh, some of our candidates have presented and how strong they are. Uh, one of the candidates presented a randomized controlled trial on the diagnostic value of different methylene blue concentrations in sentinel lymph node biopsy in breast cancer patients, a two-center pilot study. The title can be definitely much shorter. Uh, it's just a bit too mouthful, but that itself is not a problem. Uh, let's move on to the research question. So the research question is, does diluted 1% methylene blue dye have similar accuracy as undiluted 1% methylene blue dye in detecting metastatic sentinel lymph node? Of course, I don't know what the background of this question is, and I'm not sure whether this is actually of uh, significant value uh, remember what I said, uh, does it actually change uh, the impact on the patient or the clinical outcome? I'm not sure. These are the questions the, the, the student will have to answer. Uh, and then the student moves on to the research objective, which is to compare the sensitivity and specificity of both diluted and undiluted 1% methylene blue dye. And uh, uh, subsequently, the secondary objective is to calculate the negative and positive predictive values of methylene blue dye in central lymph node biopsy as well as to study the risk of skin allergy and nipple necrosis in higher concentrations of methylene blue. So the issue here seems to be that maybe uh, the diluted uh, methylene blue have a better sensory specificity, but then they do carry higher risks of other allergies, etc. So that seems to be the uh, objective of this study. This is the second one. Preoperative hand grip strength as predictor of anastomotic leak in colorectal surgery. Um, I would like to know where this study is being done uh, because that is an important concept here as well. Uh, the research question is quite straightforward. Is preoperative hand grip strength a reliable assessment to predict anastomotic leak? The primary objective is to assess the association between hand grip strength and the risk of uh, anastomotic leak as well as the secondary objective is to de determine the predictive value of the uh, hand grip strength uh, in colorectal patients. Uh, this probably is a more quantifiable uh, assessment because they're probably going to look at the hand grip strength and then look at the uh, anastomotic leak. My primary worry in this study would be sample size. Would you have enough anastomotic leaks, not enough colorectal cases? Okay. You must remember the issue here is not the number of surgeries you do. The number of surgeries you do does not matter. It must be the sample size is the number of patients with anastomotic leak. And uh, I don't really know if you would have enough numbers for you to be able to associate the anastomotic leak with the hand grip strength. But this is an interesting study. It just uh, raises questions about possible potential sample size issues. What about this study? Double-blinded randomized controlled trial for diclofenac wound infiltration versus local anesthesia uh, versus regional block for post-below-knee uh, amputations. 
So in this case, they are trying to uh, do a double blind randomized trial of wound infiltration with diclofenac versus local anesthesia versus regional block. That's three arms, right? Uh, and uh, again, the research question is which method of anesthesia pro produces more effective and better outcome for patients? What do you mean by more effective? Uh, is it better pain control? And what do you mean by better outcome? Is there a better wound, wound uh, uh, outcomes? I, I, I'm not very clear about this, right? Uh, the primary objective seems to be to compare post-op pain and patient satisfaction after below knee amputations. That's quite straightforward. Uh, I don't really have a problem with that. And uh, secondary objective is to assess potential complications using different methods. What do you mean by this? What are the potential complications that can happen? Is the wound going to break down? Uh, this is a bit unclear. So while the primary objective is clear, the secondary objective is unclear. And again, is this really going to make a big difference in my patient outcome? Is this going to change my practice? I'm not entirely sure. Uh, so again, doable study, but uh, I don't know how interesting it is or novel this is. And uh, one final study the predictive value of GERD-Q and RDQ questionnaires on eros erosive reflux esophagitis in a northern Malaysian population, a prospective study. Uh, I, I guess instead of saying in a northern Malaysian population, you can just say in a single center uh, in Penang or something or other. This uh, study, uh, uh, this, this particular candidate has actually uh, also written down the problem statement, which is an increasing number of non-indicated upper endoscopies show the need for a proper and cheap screening tool. Okay, I understand what the problem is. Uh, there is a higher, uh, there's an increasing number of upper endoscopies and he wants to uh, avoid these if possible. Uh, so the research question is, is GERD-Q questionnaire a better predictor of esophagitis than RDQ questionnaire in Northern Malaysian population? Uh, while earlier in the problem statement, he says upper endoscopies are increasing, uh, he's suddenly in the research question gone down to a very specific area of erosive esophagitis, which is actually a very small population, I guess. Uh, so I, I don't really see the proper flow between the problem statement and the research question. But let's move on to the research objective. The research objective, the primary objective is to compare the value of GERD-Q uh, versus RDQ questionnaire in the presence of endoscopic reflux esophagitis, right? Uh, again, I'm not entirely clear what this objective is going to do. So you're comparing two questionnaires and uh, he, 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 as, as somebody who's just reading the research objective, I'm not very clear about what he wants to do. Okay. Uh, moving on to the secondary objective to identify common demographic data of patients with reflux esophagitis and to determine the common presenting complaints of reflux esophagitis. There is an issue here with the secondary objective. In the first one, he's assessing he or she is assessing the GERD Q questionnaire and the RDQ questionnaire but in the secondary objective they have gone down to common demographic data. The esophagitis population is already very small and you, you want to now establish demographic data and presenting complaints of reflux esophagitis. Uh, there, there is no logical flow here right. Uh, I would like to see a logical flow of your primary objective flowing down to secondary objective. This is something all of y'all do. When you come to secondary objectives, you put common demography as a secondary objective. That should not be. The demography is part and parcel of the uh, research, uh, uh, research uh, data collection itself. If you have a secondary objective, it should be very specific and you want to actually identify a specific thing, not just demographics or presenting complaints. Okay. Right. So, these are the main uh, research question definitions uh, and usage in common practice. Uh, I've uh, explained to you all what a research question is, what a research hypothesis is, and how the research question leads to the hypothesis and finally to the objective. Once you have done this, then you can move to the next step, which is the methodology, which will be covered in the subsequent lectures. Uh, but to summarize, to devise a good research question, you can use the final criteria, which was the feasibility, uh, the interesting novelty, ethics, uh, relevance, etc. To write a good research proposal, you have to use the Peacock criteria, which we will explain in this uh, upcoming lectures. With that, uh, I will finish this current uh, lecture uh, and I'll be available for question and answer following this lecture. Thank you.